Batman Arkham City isn't the game I remember it being. For a long time, I have been in the minority of people who consider Arkham Asylum to be the series' best outing, while viewing its 2011 sequel as being bloated, sluggish, and unfocused. A potential poster boy for overambitious scope creep, flying too close to the sun and forgetting what made the formula work in the first place. Revisiting Arkham City for this review was a pleasant surprise. I still think the game has its issues, and I definitely maintain that Asylum is the better game, but this playthrough left me with a much more positive opinion overall. So, what changed? Let's find out by deep diving Arkham City's world, gameplay, plot, DLC, forgotten controversy, different ports and versions, and everything in between. This is a long video, so get comfortable and feel free to use the chapters to jump around. Arkham City is a sequel that wants to pick up where its predecessor left off, while wasting as little time as possible. Where games like Metroid are always inventing new ways to strip Samus of her upgrades and abilities, Arkham City gives us an almost fully kitted out Batman from the start. Gadget-wise, we have immediate access to the Batarang, Batclaw, Explosive Gel, Cryptographic Sequencer, and Remote Control Batarang. It's a far cry from Arkham Asylum, which started us out with just a Batarang and didn't add a second gadget until we found the explosive gel a good 45 minutes into the adventure. Likewise, we start with access to an almost full suite of combos and fighting abilities. With the exception of critical strikes, which we have to unlock again, and the special combo throw, which has been replaced with the later unlocked Bat Swarm, we have all of an Endgame Asylum Batman's techniques from the get-go. We even have some new abilities in the form of a much appreciated projectile counter, which allows us to catch thrown boxes, fire extinguishers, and other items, beatdown, which is great for quickly building combo counts, and Aerial Attack, which we'll use to take down Shielded Fogs much later on. How the hell does Arkham City introduce all of this to the player at once without overwhelming us? Initially, by not letting us be Batman. We start the game as a handcuffed Bruce Wayne, which severely limits our options. For the first 10 minutes, all we can do is walk and counter, placing a huge emphasis on that mechanic and teaching us that we cannot button bash our way through this game. We can't really attack until about 9 minutes into the game, when Bruce breaks his cuffs during a scuffle with Penguin's men. Then, without our cape or grapnel gun, we have a linear platforming tutorial to work our way up to an airdropped bat suit, complete with a gadget belt. This opening is brilliant. It's tense, it's a feasible way to introduce one mechanic at a time, it rapidly sets up the narrative tone and atmosphere, and it's also packed with easter eggs. In this short sequence, we can see Black Mask having a standoff with the guards. We meet Deadshot in the admission queue, teasing one of the side quests, and we can spot Azrael witnessing our incarceration from a nearby rooftop. You can also turn around and sock Penguin after defeating his goons. In roughly the same length of time it takes to walk the Joker through Arkham Asylum, City manages to establish so much more, while feeling like it's getting to the meat of the game much faster. That is, assuming you're playing the base game without the Catwoman DLC. We'll cover this in more detail in the DLC section, but with the DLC activated, you instead start the game fighting multiple thugs as Catwoman, and it somewhat undermines the carefully crafted tutorials that follow. Once we've suited up, the tools available to us and map design gives us immediate freedom. For example, we can ignore the courthouse in front of us, and our objective to save Catwoman, opting to explore the city instead. This even rewards us with a potentially missable encounter with Jack Ryder. I love the dialogue here. You a fan? No. The tutorials aren't finished yet. 
Although not much happens in the courthouse, besides setting an expectation for facing larger groups of enemies, even if most of them immediately flee this particular encounter, we do get introduced to the improved detective mode. Where Asylum had to scan a single object to create a trail to follow, City sometimes has us consider multiple clues within the scene. In this case, a bullet's impact on the floor and window to trace a path to a sniper. The shot came from the church, where we get our stealth tutorial. The enemies take hostages that they will kill if we're seen, meaning we can't brute force it. Interestingly, all of the takedowns we learn here are new. Batman can now perform a takedown through thin walls, do silent takedowns from above, and sneak up behind two enemies for a double takedown. I felt that Arkham Asylum's stealth was underdeveloped, so even just seeing a greater variety of contextual moves here is appreciated. Sadly, I didn't then see any enemies take any hostages until much later on. Once in the museum as Batman, and again when I was playing the Harley Quinn's Revenge DLC. So this cool punishment for getting spotted that ups the stakes is underutilized. There's also another easter egg in the church. We can see Hush laying on a bed. He leaves here for his side quest later on, so this is another blink and you'll miss it nice touch. A detail that the developers didn't have to include, yet I'm glad they did. A lot of love and care was clearly put into this game. There's then an optional tutorial for an equally optional gadget upgrade. Batman plots some AR challenges, where we need to glide through hoops and evidence our understanding of the new dive bomb mechanic. Completing these challenges rewards us with the grapnel boost. This lets us propel ourselves from ledges we grapple to, massively increasing our traversal speed across the city. It's borderline essential for completing Zaz's side quests later on, and for such a core memory and fan favourite upgrade, I struggle to believe that it's missable. I genuinely can't imagine beating this game without the grapnel boost. It's no surprise that it became a series staple, appearing in every game after this. I enjoy the context given here too. This upgrade is a prototype that isn't ready for field deployment, so Batman uses the AR challenges as a final piece of training to ensure that he's ready to use it in a real case. Now, that does create a potential continuity issue for Arkham Origins, but we'll discuss that when we cover that game. One downside of our improved movement options is that the game world feels smaller. I'll happily accept that Arkham City likely has a higher square footage than Arkham Asylum did, but running around the Asylum at ground level gave a very different sense of scale to flying over the whole thing at speed. It also changes the power dynamics. In Asylum, Batman was always looking up. He was one man down on the ground facing insurmountable odds, with it feeling like the Joker was in control. In City, we're literally above the danger, swooping down and taking out thugs, giving us much more of a power fantasy. We're the predator this time, not the prey. We have one last formal tutorial, which comes at the start of the steel mill. We've learned the basics of platforming as Bruce, but now that we've donned the cape and cowl, there are a few more movement options that the game wants to show us, including the new Mega Man-like slide. It's strange that one new move makes Batman's ground movement feel so much more fluid. We have a much more agile Batman for this outing, and ground movement generally feels more responsive. From here, the game will drip feed us mini tutorials as and when we get new gadgets and encounter new enemy types. Let's focus on those gadgets first. Looking at our starting lineup of returning gadgets, some of them, like the explosive gel, work the same as they did before, but a few have had some noteworthy tweaks and changes. While the Backlaw does return from Arkham Asylum, it's the base version of the gadget, not the ultra upgrade that can pull down walls and ceilings. I waited the entire game for the ultra version to show up, but no, it's not here. The Claw does get one handy upgrade. 
it can now be used to grab out of reach Riddler trophies. This pro doesn't outweigh the overall downgrade and reduced utility though. The remote control batarang has been promoted from an optional gadget in the previous game to something we have from the very start of this one. Its use is now required for puzzles and progression along the critical path, with this being tutorialised in the museum section. It's also put to great use for several Riddler trophies where you have to use the remote control batarang to carry an electrical charge from one area to a fuse box elsewhere. I was really happy for, and weirdly proud of, this gadget getting a spotlight. We start the game with the cryptographic sequencer, but it's not very useful to us straight out of the gate. Remember how, in Arkham Asylum, we didn't get to use it until we had Quincy Sharp's security codes? It's kind of the same deal here. There aren't many panels we can unlock with its base form. We need the Gotham City Municipal Codes and later the Tiger Security Codes before we can hack into most of Arkham City's security panels. Getting the Tiger Codes is pretty badass. We get to hang from the bottom of a helicopter during an all-out attack. The Municipal Codes, on the other hand, yeah, Bats just realises he needs them once we reach the Gotham City Police Department, and triggers a download as if it's an in-university LC for the sequencer. It's one of the more contrived blockers. Buddy, why aren't they on the sequencer just in case? The GCPD also serves as our tutorial for the sequencer. We're locked in and we need to override a panel so we can leave. In Asylum, the sequencer was a little vague and obtuse. You had to get the waveform to become erratic and the background to become green by rotating the left and right analog sticks into the right positions. It was hard to tell how close you were. City improves this by instead making it password based. The left stick reveals one half of the word while the right stick unveils the other. This provides much better feedback to us as the player. The sequencer can also be used to listen into radio frequencies. This is mainly used during the Riddler challenges, but also hides a couple of cool easter eggs. It's admittedly a secondary feature that I completely forgot about until I needed to use it though. Of course, it wouldn't be a sequel if we didn't get some brand new gadgets to play with. Once we're inside the steel mill, we get access to the remote electrical charge, which is one of the most versatile toys in the entire game. This gun can deploy a positive or negative electrical charge, with differing effects. The tutorial simply shows us it can open and close shutters. Like an idiot, I didn't read the button prompt properly, meaning my first experience was telling the already closed shutters to close, confusing myself and thinking the game had glitched. Don't be like me, I'm an idiot. We're also shown that it can be used to power large magnets, as we swing a crane to break a barrier. In stealth, we can use the REC on magnets near enemies to pull their weapons straight out of their hands, or we can fire at someone from a distance to force them to fire their gun and scare their buddies. It even has some limited combat utility. For something Batman seemingly improvises on the fly from parts he just so happens to come across, it's really versatile. The remote electrical charge will be in constant use throughout our playthrough and lends itself to some fun Riddler challenges too. The only knock against it is that, come on, this is a gun. Sure, it doesn't fire bullets, but doesn't it go against Batman's no gun rule? Our next gadget comes from the museum. This is the Disruptor, which specifically disables Mr. Freeze's ice gun. Handy, as Penguin is currently holed up in the Iceberg Lounge with that very weapon. Thankfully, there's an optional upgrade that takes this gadget from this very situational single use to being an absolute must for stealth rooms and a habitual part of our prep before entering combat, disabling firearms. It's always satisfying seeing a thug try to shoot us before realising that, oh no, their gun isn't working. As we leave the museum, Batman calls Alfred and requests a line launcher. There's a small lore detail here that I absolutely love. Alfred asks why Batman doesn't just leave the cave fully kitted out. 
Bruce says he's tried that, but it made the belt too heavy and hampered his movement. The animated version of Batman Along Halloween plays with this idea too. Your equipment's weighing you down. It certainly feels like a more concrete story justification for unlocking equipment as you go than we had in Asylum. Batman only carries the bare necessities and either procures and improvises new tech on site or requests airdrops from the Batwing as needs arise. Using this formula and justification, Rocksteady and Warner Brothers could potentially make countless Arkham games where it feels natural for Batman to be a fairly blank slate at the start of each adventure. This would eliminate the issues that other Metroidvania sequels, including Metroid itself, often face. The line launcher itself has an awesome new feature compared to its Asylum counterpart. We can now fire it again while travelling along it to take sharp corners. We even get a nice bullet time slow motion effect when we activate this trick. We can also get an optional upgrade that allows us to walk along the resulting wire, but as with Spider-Man 2, I didn't take advantage of it. In Spidey's case, wirewalk takedowns ended up being the last thing I had to grind out for the Platinum Trophy, solely because I hadn't been doing it naturally throughout my playthrough. Next, we have the Reverse Batarang, a tool that's unlocked during this standoff with Ra's al Ghul and which I… forgot I had and never used again. Seriously, this is the only footage I have of the Reverse Batarang, it's that inconsequential. The last mandatory upgrade is the Freeze Blast. Quite a few of the required and optional tools we unlock in this game come from repurposed freeze tech, how did I think about it? We can use these to plug up steam pipes, allowing safe passage, but its more common use is creating ice platforms in water which we can then stand on. We pull ourselves around on our makeshift boat by finding hooks for the backlaw to attach to and then pulling ourselves in that direction, something that's tutorialised with wooden rafts at the entrance to the iceberg lounge. It's a nice idea, but it's also kind of slow going. There are definitely times where I desperately wanted the raft to move at more than a snail's pace. We can also use this in combat or stealth sections to freeze enemies in place, with the game's final boss being based on chucking as many of these freeze blasts at it as we can. The gadget wheel is already getting kind of cluttered, but we're not done yet, as there's a series of optional gadgets and upgrades too. The Sonic Batarang returns from Asylum with the same purpose of luring enemies into our deviously devised traps. I really can't imagine the Arkham series without this particular tool, it's become a firm favourite during these revisits. The Mind Detector is technically an upgrade for the Disruptor, but I wanted to call it out here for wasting my damn time. Late into the game we get a call from some cops we saved earlier. They're at the Iceberg Lounge and have found something that they think might be useful to us. So we return to the museum, which leads directly into the Iceberg Lounge. There are new encounters and such set up along the route for us to fight our way through, indicating we're on the right track. We get to the door into the Iceberg Lounge and… it's locked. There doesn't seem to be a vent to crawl through or any other way to get in, so what gives? Turns out we have to leave the museum, go back out into the city, and instead enter the Iceberg Lounge through a side door that we've never seen or used before. While Arkham Asylum opened up more of the map and made it easier to get around as the game progressed, with the exception of Ivy's plants temporarily blocking some doors and gassing the mansion, City goes out of its way to make things harder. The steel mill's chimney gets covered, Freeze blocks the front door of the GCPD with ice, and the front of the courthouse gets bombed. In every instance we're left to find a back or side door, which is a massive inconvenience for grinding out Riddler challenges later on. So we've been misled and wound up just to get here, the gadget had better be worth it, yeah? Sadly not. The Mind Disruptor deactivates mines and is only used for Riddler trophies. I never used it, 
The only relevant footage I have is me getting the gadget, and one instance from earlier in the game where I couldn't reach a Riddler trophy in Wonder City because I didn't have this upgrade yet. The Freeze Cluster is yet another piece of repurposed technology from good old Victor Freeze. It's basically the Freeze Blast, but now it can freeze multiple enemies in place. While the Blast completely immobilizes armed thugs, the Cluster only stops them from moving. They can still shoot you. Yeah, I didn't use this one either. If this had been a straight upgrade to the Freeze Blast, which still prevented armed thugs from firing, I would have just said, thanks for the upgrade, and it would have replaced the blast without a second thought. As a standalone gadget that's balanced out against the original, it's a wasted slot in our already padded inventory. Our utility belt quickly fills up with a variety of gadgets, and they're clearly not created equally. We have our go-to favourites that we'll be using constantly, especially that disruptor, and then we have items that just sit there, gathering dust. The quantity makes it awkward to quickly select the right gadget, as not only do we have to remember where it is, we have to double tap for items on the outer ring. In time-sensitive situations, there's a high chance that we'll fumble, select the wrong thing, and either miss an opportunity or get Batman killed because of it. Also, for some reason, the returning gadgets from Asylum are in different spots now, so my muscle memory from that game kept tripping me up and causing me to select the wrong thing in this sequel. It's a very unfocused and bloated selection of things the developers thought would be a cool idea. It would have benefited from some editorial fat trimming, from remembering that less is more, and applying the rule of just because we can doesn't mean we should. Clearly there was some attempt at optimization. The Disruptor became a Swiss army knife and the cryptographic sequencer doubles as a radio, but there are other obvious missed opportunities to combine or cut some of these gadgets, such as my earlier suggestion of combining the Freeze Blast and Freeze Cluster. There's an over-reliance on tech that we've air quotes borrowed from Mr. Freeze. I felt less like Batman and more like Victor's sidekick. No matter how I look at this lineup, I'm left dissatisfied. Combat's in a weird spot in Arkham City. It expands with a number of new moves and enemy types, while returning flavours of bad guys have to be dealt with differently as a result. A basic example is enemies carrying blades. In Asylum, they had a red attack indicator showing that we couldn't counter them, and we had to cape stun them before we could attack them. Here in City, they have a yellow attack indicator and slash at us three times. We have to now dodge these swipes by holding the analog stick in the opposite direction of their attack, while pressing dodge at the same time. We can get an upgrade called the Blade Dodge Takedown, which means that executing this perfect triple dodge results in an instant takedown. I could never get the timing for this on console, but the PC's improved performance means I actually pulled this off a couple of times during this playthrough. That said, once these goons are mixed in with larger groups, they usually take me by surprise and get at least one good hit in. I usually double tap dodge to jump over their heads and attack from behind instead, as it's a much easier way to deal with these foes. If we're not using the cape stun against knives, swords, and other blades, where are we using it? A few thug variants share it. First up is the new armoured enemy. We have to do a cape stun so that we can then initiate a beatdown. This is a flurry of rapid strikes that eventually end in a knockout. It's especially handy during combat challenges, where the goal is to get a high score. Your combo count acts as a multiplier, so you can use the beatdown, which works on most foes, to get the combo count up and start earning some serious points. It kind of breaks the difficulty of those challenges in half, you can imagine a lot of people abuse it. We also use the cape stun against shielded enemies. Thugs will now pick up car doors and other objects to use as makeshift riot shields. To defeat them, we cape stun them, and then we double tap dodge in their direction to jump up and attack them from above. 
Titans return from Arkham Asylum, but they're defeated in a different way. Instead of waiting for them to charge, throwing a batarang and then dodging out of the way, we instead do an Ultra Stun, which is performed by tapping the stun button three times, opening the Titan up to attack. This method also works against the Ambromovich twins, Mr. Hammer and Mr. Sickle. They're tall mountains of muscle, wielding large weapons of their namesakes. One works for Penguin, while the other's employed by the Joker. Stunstick enemies also return, although they don't show up until much later this time around. They're still dealt with in the same way as before, though. You simply hop over their heads and attack them from behind. This is, of course, in addition to the standard brawlers, people throwing boxes and other objects, and enemies using guns. Encounters are on a significantly larger scale. We'll be facing off with tons of inmates at a time, which can make it difficult to pick out specialist enemy types that can only be dealt with in one set way. This is especially true when Arkham City's warring factions means that Joker's specialists look different to Penguins, Two-Facers, and the Tiger Guards, making it even harder to identify who needs what approach. It can become overwhelming, confusing, and frustrating at times. This is a combat system all about getting into and maintaining a flow state, and when it works, it's glorious. We feel like absolutely untouchable badasses smashing faces in left, right, and center. However, there are also a lot of times where it might be tricky to get that first string of attacks going, or where the combo is unexpectedly broken by a specialist that was out of view. My muscle memory for Asylum makes me use outdated tactics. Come on, Sam, stop cape-stunning knife enemies. Or Batman, for whatever reason, punches the air instead of the goon you were targeting. I would say that it's balanced out by Batman being more powerful than ever before, with a variety of new moves and takedowns. We now have access to Free Flow Focus, which activates with a combo chain of 12 or above. Focus means we move faster, hit harder, and it keeps going until we use a special combo move or gadget. It limits our options, but works well for those who crave the comparative simplicity of Asylum's combat. In terms of those special combo moves, the standard special combo takedown returns, allowing you to instantly remove a thug from the fight. Asylum's throw is replaced with Bat Swarm, an area of effect attack that stuns nearby enemies and is great for buying time and gaining some breathing room. Multi-ground takedown eliminates any thugs that are currently stunned on the ground. Meanwhile, Disarm and Destroy not only takes an armed enemy out of the running, it also means that another foe can't pick up and use that weapon. It's also easier to use gadgets in battle. In Asylum, we had two shortcuts, one for the Batarang and one for the Backclaw. Here in Arkham City, we can hold the left trigger and press different face buttons to deploy different tools. For example, left trigger and north face button will fire the back law, while left trigger and east face button fires the remote electrical charge. It's a lot to consider. In my opinion, too much. The best point for comparison is Arkham Asylum's Free Flow Perfection Trophy and Arkham City's Perfect Free Flow 2.0. Both require you to perform a combo using all of Batman's combat moves. In Arkham Asylum, we needed to perform a strike, a counter, a stun, an evade, a special combo instant takedown, a special combo throw, a ground takedown, quickfire backlaw, and quickfire batarang. Meanwhile, in Arkham City, we need to pull off a strike, a counter, a stun, an evade, a special combo instant takedown, a special combo bat swarm, a special combo disarm and destroy, a special combo multi ground takedown, a ground takedown, an aerial attack, a beatdown with finisher, an ultra stun, and any of the four quick fire gadgets. A separate trophy, Gadget Attack, acknowledges how tricky it would be to work all of the gadgets into a single combo, as it requires us to use all five quick fire gadgets in one fight rather than one combo. Fortunately, the Blade Dodge takedown is completely omitted from the requirements, possibly due to being situational, requiring a bladed enemy to be in the fight, and a pain in the ass to actually pull off. Where I can, and have, pulled off the requirements for Asylum's Free Flow Perfection on Xbox 360, PlayStation 4, and Steam, 
I've even done it multiple times for the score bonus alone. I am intimidated by the requirements of Cities Perfect Free Flow 2.0 and have never unlocked it in any version of the game. Between the increased enemy variety, Batman's expanded moveset, and the sheer number of bodies involved in brawls, there are just too many moving parts that we need to keep track of. This is proof that there can be too much of a good thing. I feel that the developers got overly ambitious and spoiled the broth by adding too many ingredients. It's frustrating and disappointing because when everything clicks, it does work wonderfully and feels great but almost every encounter had that fly in the ointment, that one step too far that brought the entire dance to a screeching halt. Based on Arkham City's general reputation online as the best entry into the series, an opinion I sadly don't share, I think that I'm going to be in the minority on this one, with some angry people in the comments section, but I stand by what I said. There's simply too much going on here, and I much prefer Asylum's more focused and distilled take on the formula, where there are fewer variables to consider. On the other hand, I described Arkham Asylum's stealth sections as being underbaked, with most of its still overall limited options being hidden behind optional level up unlocks and only communicated to us in the separated challenge maps, which we're most likely to complete post-game. I also felt that the balancing was completely broken in Batman's favour once you got the Sonic Batarang. This is where Arkham City had the biggest opportunity for improvement. The previous game had supplied a great template to build on, and for my money, Rocksteady knocked it out of the park. Batman was previously overpowered due to the use of gargoyles, allowing us to stay out of sight and survey the room, and detective vision which showed us exactly where the enemies were, their current emotional state, and what weapons they have. Where Asylum was happy to just attach bombs to the gargoyles in later levels, a tacit admission they were too useful, City adds a new enemy type that specifically looks up and scans gargoyles. This is a great in-between as it presents a risk to relying too heavily on the gargoyles, while also still giving us the option of using them a little more sparingly. We can get an upgrade that counters this too. Initially, we'll be spotted by these thugs as soon as they scan a gargoyle that we're on, but the heat signature conceal makes it so that they only spot us if we move during the scan. That can still lead to some tense moments where we might have the perfect opportunity for a takedown, but we can't capitalise on it because we're having to treat the scanner like a Jurassic Park T-Rex. It's not just scanners that we have to worry about. If we get spotted and escape into the relative safety of the gargoyles, then the enemies will start shooting at and destroying those gargoyles. It's an effective punishment that makes the inmates seem a little smarter. Arkham City also adds enemies carrying jamming devices. These interfere with our detective vision, making it functionally useless. Detective mode will, however, show us where the jamming is coming from, helping us prioritise, isolate, and neutralise that particular foe first, restoring our X-ray advantage. The next grunt they introduce is less interesting. Some inmates drop proximity mines behind them, making it near impossible to perform a stealth takedown from behind, which would be a much bigger issue if we didn't have several options for dealing with them. I only remember encountering one of these during my playthrough, and their presence was almost completely inconsequential. A swing and a miss, sadly. Batman's expanded gadget selection gives us more room to play with our food. We can disrupt signal jammers or make enemies involuntarily shoot and scare their comrades with the remote electrical charge. We can disable weapons outright with the disruptor. We can freeze people in place with the freeze blast, and that's on top of our returning abilities from Asylum, such as the magnificent inverted takedown. There are other little quality of life improvements sprinkled in. In Asylum, you could pop out of a floor grate with the south face button and then do a stealth takedown with the north face button. In City, that's all mapped to one button for a seamless action. In Asylum, stealth takedowns were long animations that you were locked into, which was a death sentence if you got spotted. In City, you can now interrupt that animation with a noisy knockout smash, 
giving you an opportunity to get away in a pinch. Where City really manages to elevate these stealth sections is in providing us with these higher priority targets though. When we enter a room, our prey is not made equal. We know we want to remove that signal jammer and that gargoyle scanner first, so they make that enemy more difficult to knock out by placing them in a group, giving them a high visibility patrol route, or making them an informant that you have to take out last. More on that when we discuss Riddler's challenges. Overall, I found City's stealth gameplay to be far more engaging and varied than its predecessors. This was a true improvement and evolution on what came before. Something that was most apparent during the stealth sections was the reuse of past areas. It seemed like every stealth room was used at least twice during the story's critical path, just with a different combination of enemies. That was unfortunate. The game does feel like it pads itself out in some very obvious ways that even a casual player would notice. The most obvious example is in the museum. We need to find Mr. Freeze, so we go to the coldest place in Arkham City, the Gotham City Police Department, where we learn that the Penguin has kidnapped Mr. Freeze and is holding him in the museum. We fly across town to get to and enter the museum, where we discover that our cryptographic sequencer won't work, and we can't open the first door because the Penguin has installed signal jammers around Arkham City. So, we exit the museum, find and destroy three signal jammers, one of which is underground in an abandoned train station, and then we finally return to the museum, using our sequencer to open the first gate, free freeze, and beat up Penguin. If you're wondering if we then return to the GCPD with Freeze, no, not yet. For story reasons, we instead chase an assassin across town, and it's a good couple of hours before we're back where we started. I'll get to that in the plot section. The overworld city itself was always going to feel somewhat repetitive, with you bouncing from one end to the other and back along mostly the same flight path, but later returns see snipers set up waiting for you, forcing you to slowly and methodically take them down before proceeding. The loudest groan was on exiting the GCPD the second time, seeing Vicky Vale's helicopter getting shot down and being tasked with saving her, all of which interrupts the main plot in order to set up an optional side quest. Rocksteady didn't even try to hide the fact that they were wasting my time on multiple occasions. I don't understand why the developers included so much backtracking while reusing so many rooms multiple times. The game's not short. My playthrough, including the interwoven Catwoman DLC and casually doing side quests as they popped up, came to just over 10 hours, but it felt like it should have been closer to 7 or 8. It sadly outstayed its welcome by stretching its content out. On a positive note, once I was in the museum, I thoroughly enjoyed that location. Likewise for the steel mill. The interiors felt very similar to Arkham Asylum. They were linear, each encounter was carefully planned, there were Riddler trophies hidden just off the beaten path for those curious enough, and they were paced to near perfection with a great mix of gameplay styles. Sure, not all interiors are made equal. The Courthouse, GCPD, and Wonder Tower mostly take place in a single room. Still, Arkham City was able to surprise me. All of the game's highs took place during these focused, guided, indoor experiences where the developers could more easily predict our route and set up bespoke events along the way. Credit where it's due, a lot of these locations feel inhabited. You can tell that the various gangs of Arkham City were quick to establish their turf, their base of operations, and put their stamp on the place. You would expect the Joker's decorations to be the most eccentric, but it seems that Harley did most of the customizations. During this revisit, I discovered that I had misremembered some things about the game. In my mind, the Demon Trials took one look at the Scarecrow sections from Asylum and said, hold my beer. Playing that section again, though? No, this doesn't impress as much. Its sole trick is combining the desert with elements of the city and adding some floating rocks. In a direct comparison, Scarecrow is more visually, technically, and thematically impressive, 
drawing upon Bruce's psychology, combining that with the oppressive architecture of the asylum, and adding a dash of ethereal, Escher-painting, dreamlike layouts. Oddly enough, the optional Mad Hatter side quest, while short-lived, is more bizarre and hallucinatory than the Demon Trials. I felt a tad disappointed when I realised that. The most underwhelming location is, by far, the city itself. As mentioned earlier, it feels a lot smaller than I recalled, possibly due to the ever-expanding scope of games released since. Being able to fly from one end to the other in two minutes really reduces the sense of scale. It doesn't help that this massive, inverse-U-shaped wall exists in the middle, reducing visibility and smartly limiting the amount of objects being rendered, while also presumably enforcing and protecting invisible load zones. The only time that the city felt large was during the Wonder Tower climb, where I could see the entire thing in one camera shot. Just from a rendering standpoint alone, that's an impressive achievement for its time. While there are clearly themed areas and noteworthy landmarks, you certainly know when you're in Joker's turf, a lot of the titular city can feel the same. If you were to show me a screenshot from Arkham Asylum, or City's interior locations, I'm fairly confident that I could tell you where that screenshot was taken. Show me a still of City's fairly similar streets and alleyways? Eh, I think most of us would struggle to pinpoint a location. At the ground level, it kind of blurs together. Where Arkham Asylum itself was the star of its own game, Arkham City itself lacks an identity and really struggles to leave an impression. We have a mixed selection of bosses this time around. We don't encounter our first, air quotes, proper boss battle, as in they have an on-screen health bar, until we reach the Iceberg Lounge a few hours in. After catching up to the penguin, disabling his stolen freeze gun, and giving him a satisfying smack, we find ourselves in a battle with Solomon Grundy, whose model is very reminiscent of comic artist Ed McGuinness's work, especially the muscle structure. We don't take the brute on directly. Instead, we have to use explosive gel to destroy the electrical equipment that keeps restoring Grundy's health. In Phase 2, timed shutters limit our physical access, while Phase 3 locks Grundy in a single position as he sends out shockwaves across the arena, again making it harder to access the equipment we need to blow up. This is very much a test of our ability to dodge attacks and solve basic puzzles. This combination of wit, agility, and gadgets to overcome a much larger and stronger foe feels inherently Batman. I really enjoyed this fight. We're not done yet, though, as Penguin tries to take us on with a grenade launcher in a very short-lived and cathartic pummeling. It's some nice icing on the cake as we get payback for all of the nonsense he's put us through. The development team must have grinned ear to ear when they thought to add this. Our next fight is against Ra's al Ghul, and... Mm, mm, not as impressive as I remember. It cycles between dodging oversized attacks while firing the remote electrical charge in between gaps in Raish's shield, and battling a mass melee army of sand people, one of which will be a disguised Raish. One thing I will give this fight credit for is this sequence where you have to repeatedly counter his sword attacks. In my mind, I had associated this with Deathstroke's fight from the next game, Arkham Origins, but hey, turns out that City did it first. Raish is also overshadowed by a battle that follows shortly after, a boss encounter that appears on almost every top 10 bosses list, Mr. Freeze. Due to his armour and weaponry, Batman can't take Freeze in a head-on fight. Instead, this is a stealth encounter. Freeze is smart though, so each type of stealth takedown will only work once. Yes, this fight can be tense, the gargoyles have been frozen over, keeping us on the ground, Sure, it forces us to learn and use techniques we might not have experimented with otherwise, something that we previously only experienced in optional challenge maps. It is satisfying when we nail him, especially if it's with a new toy, an item we rarely use, or we've lured Freeze into a trap after he's deployed his heat-seeking trackers. One of the greatest boss battles ever, though. 
An intense cat and mouse scenario that makes us sweat? I mean, it's different, sure, but it's also a tad long in the tooth. Depending on the difficulty mode, we need to hit freeze with up to nine unique stealth takedowns. For context, there are 12 possible ways to damage him, and you can't use the same method twice. Yeah, this gets old kinda fast. From here, our next mandatory boss fight is a two-phase encounter with Clayface. Round one involves dodging the big guy's attacks while throwing freeze blasts at him, and round two is more of the same, only now he has smaller drones rushing us in a tighter space. Phase one feels similar to the Grundy fight. We can't attack head-on. We're primarily dodging, and our only option is to use a specific gadget. Phase 2, meanwhile, feels more like the race encounter due to the drones swarming us. Only this time, we're the ones holding a sword. Kind of weird that they made a whole set of combat animations for this one scene. Seems like a lot of work for very little return on investment. Definitely the kind of thing you wouldn't see in today's overly optimized and efficiency driven development cycles. It's a better final boss than Asylum's Titan Joker, which isn't a high bar to clear. Still, a decent way for us to end the game. That is, assuming you don't have the DLC, which we'll cover in its own section. It seems strange that Arkham City only has four mandatory bosses, and that they're so oddly placed, with the first being a few hours in, and the rest almost feeling like they occur back to back. City seems to instead rely on mini-bosses like the Ambromovich twins, the odd titan, and large-scale combat encounters in place of having a higher quantity of traditional bosses. Some face-offs that we might consider as bosses are relegated to side quests, which we're about to discuss, but in terms of foes you have to fight, we actually had more bosses in Asylum. Even if I discount Asylum's titans and merge the three scarecrow encounters into one entry, I still get five big bads in Asylum compared to City's four, with, despite Asylum's reputation, more varied gameplay styles and approaches in the former game. Who knew? Arkham City houses every inmate from both Blackgate and Arkham Asylum plus political prisoners, people Hugo Strange needed to dispose of. As such, there are a lot of villains roaming around who aren't part of the main story, giving us several distinct side quests to complete. These aren't created equally, far from it. At one end of the spectrum, we have collecting the Mind Disruptor from Gordon's undercover cops, and at the other end we have 400 Riddler challenges, nearly double Asylum's 240. These side missions can be as inconsequential as saving political prisoners who are getting beaten up, as and when you happen upon them, to fully-fledged story arcs in their own right. The first one we're likely to come across is Bane. The Giant informs us that some of Dr. Young's Titan formula made it off Arkham Island. Considering it's a derivative of Bane's own venom, with Dr. Young having strung the Santa Priskin up to bleed him dry during her research, he feels compelled to destroy all 12 remaining canisters of it. We agree to split the load, taking on six containers ourselves. These fats are mostly placed along the critical path, so it's pretty easy to integrate this side quest into our normal playthrough. It's non-disruptive, it follows up on one of the three potential post credit scenes of Asylum, and it culminates in us fighting side by side with the Behemoth against an onslaught of Tiger Guards. I would say it's worth going out of our way for this one, seeing as we don't even need to make that much effort to complete it. After we leave the courthouse for the first time, we can meet up with Azrael. This mysterious figure appears in a few locations around Arkham City, leaving a symbol behind each time. These symbols create a map that leads us to a final chat with him, where he makes some vague statements which allude to the plot of Arkham Knight, so we'll follow up on this when we get to that game. All I'll say for now is make sure you throw a remote Batarang at him to get the otherwise missable catch trophy. I found the Mad Hatter's inclusion a little frustrating. Unlike most side quests, the Mad Hatter is initially shown within the main story. I mentioned Vicky Vale's helicopter getting shot down. Well, when we rescue her, we see a glimpse of the Hatter in the cutscene. 
This is immediately followed by Alfred calling to say he's manufactured a cure for the Joker-infected blood that's currently killing Batman. When we collect that cure, we pass out. The Hatter had planted a suggestion in our minds, presumably while we were saving Vicky, that made us imagine the thing we wanted most, the cure. We awaken at Mad Hatter's tea party. He's trying to mind control us, and we're resisting by fighting off waves of goons in this cool, dreamlike sequence atop a pocket watch. As it's only the one fight, the mission quickly ends. What's strange is that, like all of the side quests, this mission can be left until after you've completed the main story where, spoilers, Batman gets cured. The Dark Knight would have no use for this hypnotically suggested airdropped alternative, but it seems like Rocksteady didn't include an alternate cutscene or explanation for this. It also got me thinking about a potential plot hole for the main story, which we'll discuss in the plot spoilers section. There are phones scattered across Arkham City that might start ringing when we're nearby. The serial killer, Zaz, is on the other end of the phone. He's got hostages that he'll kill if we don't race across the city to another phone elsewhere, so... Arkham City with a vengeance. This side quest didn't do the game any favours, as it's where I noticed two things. Performance drops as I seemingly flew through invisible load zones too quickly, and the aforementioned small scale of Arkham City itself. The performance issues were resolved by moving the game from a hard disk drive to a solid state drive. More on that in the version comparisons. And the size we already discussed as possibly being a case of our traversal speed rather than raw square footage. Zaz also had a bad habit of interrupting other missions. For example, a phone started ringing while I was following a blood trail for a completely unrelated side quest. I felt I had to answer it, despite knowing it would leave me on the opposite end of town and I'd have to return to finish following this trail afterwards. One tip, don't be an idiot like me. When we answer the second phone and Zaz starts talking, we're supposed to use the left analog stick to track the signal. I sat there like adult listening to Zaz's life story for the first four calls before noticing the instruction in the bottom left. Thankfully, if we finish all of the time trials without having traced a call, the game will just give us Zaz's location anyway. Once we do, we get a platforming and stealth combo pack before finally taking the mass murderer down. There is one Zaz-related easter egg that I appreciate too. In the museum, we can see Penguin had an exhibit for Zaz that he escaped from. Again, nice little touch, environmental storytelling that lots of players won't notice, but I'm glad Rocksteady made the effort. Saz isn't the only murderer on the loose in Arkham City. The contract killer Deadshot, who we briefly see at the very start of the game, is also working his way through a hit list. This side quest briefly gives us a couple of cool crime scenes where we again trace bullets back to their point of origin, as we did at the start of the main story campaign but sadly ends in an underwhelming and short-lived encounter where we simply and easily sneak up on Deadshot to take him down. Besides enjoying Batman and Oracle celebrating each clue that brings us one step closer to finding Deadshot, I admittedly found this to be one of Arkham City's weaker distractions. One thing I noticed is that this Deadshot doesn't look like the Deadshot we now see and can play as in Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League. Apparently, that game provides an in-universe explanation that retcons Arkham City's Deadshot to be an imposter. I don't know the full details as I've not played Suicide Squad yet, but if this guy is a fake, he's a bloody good one considering some of the shots he's able to pull off here, including ricocheting a bullet off a wall to hit a target that was behind cover. There are more murder victims to be found, as we'll also come across corpses that have had their faces removed. Investigating these will lead us to meeting with the villain, Hush. Now, there's been some confusion with this side quest, as it feels a lot like Arkham is introducing Hush for the first time in this universe. Some people view these murder investigations and Hush's unmasking as Rocksteady giving us his origin story. That seemingly contradicts with Hush having an unlockable character profile in Arkham Asylum, found by scanning Dr. Elliot's name on a staff rotor, 
implying he was active and known to Bruce before Arkham City. If we compare this with the comics, however, we might remember that Hush was never unmasked in his debut appearance. In a 2002 storyline running from Batman issues 609 to 619, Hush is all but confirmed to be Bruce's childhood friend, Thomas Elliot, but is shot by a seemingly reformed Two-Face, yeah, it's a whole thing, and falls off a bridge before he can be unmasked. It wasn't until 2008, in Detective Comics issues 846 through 850, that we got the Heart of Hush storyline, and a revelation that Dr. Elliot had surgically altered his appearance to match Bruce Wayne's. If Hush existed in the source material for six years before the moment Arkham City is very loosely adapting, then he absolutely could have been active in the Arkhamverse beforehand. Yes, the Arkham Asylum bio says Hush was unmasked in this canon, as Dr. Thomas Elliot. City is simply when he alters his face to match Bruce's, which again is aligned with the source material. Impersonating Bruce wasn't Elliot's first plan or origin story. That means Arkham Asylum's database entry isn't a contradiction or plot hole, despite what the Arkham Wiki may tell you. What is contentious is how Hush is treated after this point. This was one hell of a setup for an amazing showdown in a future game, and Arkham Knight's payoff is... Well, we'll get to that when we chat about Knight. By far, the biggest side quest is Riddler's. There are things that Rocksteady both improved and somehow simultaneously made worse about Riddler in Arkham City. We'll start with the positives. Batman and us as the players are given more incentive to track the Riddler down. In Arkham Asylum, we got a call from Riddler near the start of the game, and completing his challenges led to his off-screen arrest, which we hear the audio from. It's uneventful with extremely low stakes. In Arkham City, the Riddler takes several people hostage and we need to complete his challenges in order to free them. Lives are on the line. We're also given something called the Enigma Machine. Once we've completed enough challenges, we can complete a riddle in the Enigma Machine to find the location of one of Riddler's hostages. Once there, we complete a short puzzle, where Riddler often cheats, in order to save that person's life. This makes Riddler much more antagonistic while providing us with clear checkpoint markers and a regular feeling of significant progression. There's also a greater variety of tasks. Destructible balloons and CCTV cameras act as Joker Teeth did in the previous game. In the case of the sewers, the Joker Teeth just outright return. And we still have visual riddles to scan. The riddle trophies themselves see a glow up usually requiring more steps, gadget combinations, and critical thinking to grab them. I genuinely had a lot of fun working some of these puzzles out. Let's see, so that, uh, 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 okay, okay. Yeah, no, now it's active. Alright, just gotta go grab it now. The rewards are also pretty cool. As before, we have character trophies, bios, and interview tapes that expand on the Arkhamverse lore, but now we also get Arkham Stories. These short tales fill in some of the blanks and provide additional world building. I especially appreciated the context provided for Wonder City, which otherwise seemed very out of place. It starts to lose me on three fronts. The first is the sheer quantity of challenges. There are 400, 440 including the Catwoman DLC, which seems overwhelming and excessive. Some of the challenges relate to gameplay feats, such as gliding certain distances, or firing the remote electrical charge at a signal jammer enemy. Thankfully, one consistently spawns in this disused train station post-game, so it's still doable after the story wraps up. 
you're welcome. My issue is that these dictate gameplay styles and reminded me of having to grind out the last trophy for webline takedowns in Spider-Man 2. The final issue are the Riddler informants. These are people Riddler used to help place the trophies and challenges around Arkham City. They'll be highlighted in green, and if we take them out last, we can interrogate them to have the location of trophies and riddles marked on our map. This adds an extra layer to combat and stealth encounters throughout the main story, as we're incentivized to make sure the last guy standing is Riddler's. I found it really hard to get into the combat's intended flow state because I was working around these Riddler guys, dodging instead of countering, aiming my attacks away from them and towards others, and just generally treating them like the plague, losing loads of combos as a result. I was originally going to say that I've never finished the Riddler's quest in Arkham City. It's always seemed like too big of a task. However, I did find it more enjoyable during this playthrough, and with me now owning a Steam Deck, I could see myself sitting on the train to work, taking down Riddler informants to fill up my map, and then going out there and completing the associated challenges. During the editing of this video, I've been doing exactly that not only on the train to work, but on the couch when the wife or kids want the TV, or as an alternative to reading before bed. I am, at the time of this rewrite, over three quarters of the way there, and by the time this video actually releases, I may well have finished it. I am finding it oddly relaxing and far more enjoyable than I expected. Sure, it has a little bit of a Mario Odyssey moon issue, where there are so many found so often that it's difficult for each individual challenge to stand out, but I found that once I stopped being paralysed by the perceived scope of the task, I actually quite liked it. One thing I have repeatedly run into, though, is that revisiting previous areas can be harder than it should be thanks to events throughout the game that blow up, freeze over, or otherwise lock entrances and exits. Where Arkham Asylum became easier to explore with more routes and options opening up as the game progressed, the opposite is true here, and that directly clashes with this particular post-game task. Something that might keep me from ever achieving 100% though is Challenge Mode. This is the same as it was in Arkham Asylum. We have combat encounters where we need to achieve a high score, and stealth rooms where we're asked to take out thugs in specific ways. There are more of these than before, that's fine. Where I draw the line is the campaigns. A campaign is a series of three challenge maps back to back with nine stars up for grabs. This doesn't quite mean three consecutive perfect runs, as you have unlimited retries of the first map, followed by three retries to share across maps two and three. There are three single-use modifiers that make things easier or harder, sometimes offering up a free star. All of the modifiers have to be used, so a lot of people try to get them out of the way in that first map. Problem is, I don't believe I have that sort of consistency in me, and while I could see myself doing each challenge map once, I can't see myself doing it again with higher stakes given the fear of then screwing up in the next map of the campaign. That said, I felt paralysed by Riddler's story challenges, and Steam Deck sessions helped me overcome that, so maybe this is something else I can leisurely chip away at on a handheld. Arkham City also adds a new game plus, essentially acting as a very hard mode. This, of course, has a trophy tied to it, so if you want the Platinum, you're going to have to do the story twice. I didn't mind difficulty-related trophies in Arkham Asylum, because I could pick hard from the get-go and do everything in one run, but because New Game Plus only unlocks after the credits roll, you have to do a minimum of two runs of Arkham City. I don't mind New Game Plus modes in games in general, going back with all of your upgrades and taking on a harder challenge. I do take issue when they feel more mandatory, like this one does. It's just another thing that puts me off going for 100% in this title. Maybe it could make for a fun stream sometime. Just sit down with an audience and play through it, but it's certainly something I would have to be in the mood for. Perhaps as a victory lap after clearing the other achievements. Another annoyance for trophy hunters is Calendar Man. He can be found in a cell below the courthouse. 
visiting him on certain holidays will cause him to tell us about one of his past crimes. Thankfully, he's not a formal side quest, but he does have an achievement tied to him. I don't know anyone who didn't simply go offline, change the clock on their console or PC, and bang this out as quickly as possible. Be warned that using this exploit can damage your save file. The game even froze on me during it. Thankfully, I didn't lose any data though. With the exception of Christmas nights, I've never liked this kind of thing. Calendar Man is an inconvenience on the road to the Platinum Trophy. Now that we've thoroughly discussed the game itself, let's talk about the plot. Naturally, this is going to be a spoiler-heavy section, so if you've somehow yet to play this 13-year-old game, turn back now. Dr. Hugo Strange is initially presented as the big bad of this title. He's the Warden of Arkham City. He's planning something called Protocol 10, and worse still, he's had Bruce Wayne arrested and incarcerated because he knows that Bruce is Batman. He even threatens to reveal Batman's secret identity to the public if Bruce tries to stop him. And if you try to stop me, I guarantee everyone will know your secret. Of course, Bruce is stubborn and suits up all of ten minutes later, ignoring Hugo's threat. Funnily enough, the writers seem to forget about that particular detail too. Robin swings by to drop off our line launcher later on, and he reiterates that Doctor Strange knows Batman's identity. If Strange really knows who you are, what happens if he tells everyone? Yet nothing ever comes of it. It's really weird considering that while Batman doesn't seem concerned about his secret identity here, in Arkham Knight he cares enough to blow up Wayne Manor. The most payoff we get is discovering that Hugo is being funded by Ra's al Ghul and his League of Assassins. Hugo got Ra's backing by taking Batman's secret to the demon. Maybe it was Ra's that prevented Hugo from playing his trump card. At any rate, it's a shame that the bluff remains just that, as it could have led to some interesting storytelling with Batman being compromised or having to operate without Doctor Strange catching on. So that's the goal, right? Find out what Protocol 10 is, stop it, and defeat Hugo. Yes and no. Our first stop is the courthouse where we get some painfully punny dialogue between Two-Face and Catwoman. You certainly know how to keep a girl hanging, Harv. Time to die. I vote for a stay of execution. How's it hanging, Harv? <laughs> yes, they did use that last one twice in the span of about two and a half minutes. A plus rating there, guys. Really well done. Once we save Catwoman, she mentions the Joker. The clown tries to snipe Selina for her trouble, which immediately changes Batman's priorities. We learned that the Joker is somehow dying from his exposure to the Titan formula in the previous game, and when we catch up to him, he infects us too. Now we have to find a cure before we both die, putting our investigation into Protocol 10 on hold. While Batman's initially fine with him and Joker dying, his nemesis reveals an insurance policy. Joker's also shipped his blood to emergency rooms across Gotham, infecting the general public. That's enough to spur us into action. The Joker had contracted Mr. Freeze to develop a cure, but Victor's gone silent. We track down Freeze by finding the coldest point in Gotham, the Gotham City Police Department, only to learn that he's been kidnapped. This is where Arkham City, like its predecessor, starts to string us along and pad itself out. Freeze is being held captive by the Penguin in the museum across town. When we defeat Penguin and free Freeze, we learn that the cure is incomplete as it needs a regenerative compound in order to remain stable. Batman immediately suggests taking a sample from Ra's al Ghul's blood, given his use of Lazarus Pits to extend his life and even return from the dead. Thankfully, a member of the League of Assassins just so happens to overhear us and we're able to follow her back to her masters. Underground, in the abandoned Wonder City, we find Talia al Ghul, her father Raish, and a conveniently located Lazarus Pit. On the verge of death, we trick Talia and Raish into believing we're here to finally accept Raish's repeated offer of leading the League of Assassins. 
A concoction we drink during their demon trials keeps us going for now, and after a brief scuffle with Raish, we have the sample we needed for Mr. Freeze. Before we can deliver that sample to Freeze, we have to save a recently arrived Quincy Sharp, former Warden of Arkham City and current Mayor of Gotham City. He reveals that Strange, you know, the guy who was introduced as a big bad but hasn't been mentioned for hours now, helped Sharp get elected on the condition that Hugo was made Warden of Arkham City. He also reveals that Doctor Strange has benefactors with seemingly limitless funds, implying a bigger bad is lurking in the shadows. Now we've had a somewhat awkward reminder that we've completely ignored our investigation into Protocol 10 thus far, we deliver Raisha's blood sample, which Mr. Freeze uses to immediately synthesize a cure like some kind of 12th level intellect. Of course, Freeze immediately betrays and tries to extort us. While we're fighting Freeze, Harley steals the cure and heads back to the steel mill to deliver it to the Joker. As we chase Harley through the steel mill, we finally learn what Protocol 10 is. You know, the thing we were here to investigate but then immediately stopped investigating. In short, Strange has been distributing weapons and instigating fights between Arkham's various factions to incite violence, claim Arkham City has failed, and get authorization for what's basically genocide in order to prevent a mass breakout. That apparently isn't important right now. Instead, we prioritize our own life by chasing the cure. We catch up with Joker, a massive fight ensues, and we get trapped under falling debris. Talia saves us by offering Joker the secret to immortality and leaves with him, but not before activating a tracking beacon. We come to as Catwoman helps us out of the debris and Protocol 10 starts in the background. I do like this little exchange and callback from the courthouse though. I figured you could use my help, Selina. You're right. I think I chipped a nail back there. Funny. Figured you could use my help. You're right. I think I chipped a nail back there. You stick with the brooding. I'll handle the wisecracks. It's just a nice little moment that humanizes the characters, gives us an insight into their relationship, and proves that Rocksteady understands that Batman is ultimately human. He's not a one-dimensional angst machine, and it's great to see that here. Batman exits into Arkham City, as Tiger helicopters rain down machine gun fire and missiles, massacring hundreds of inmates in an indiscriminate and inhumane slaughter. Man, if only we'd had, say, ten hours to investigate this, we might have been able to prevent it. This is where we finally get to confront Hugo Strange and learn that the big bad Quincy alluded to is Ra's al Ghul. Now, this reveal, plus the Riddler's unlockable stories about Wonder City, confirmed that it's not a coincidence that there's a Lazarus Pit under Wonder Tower, that Raish has a base of operations here, or that Arkham City just so happened to be built here. Contrivance, yes. Coincidence, no. Raish betrays Hugo, Hugo betrays Raish, Wonder Tower explodes, and Hugo and Raish both seem to die in the process. Although Raish's body has disappeared if we come back later, just as it vanishes from the Morgan Arkham Asylum, implying his League has recovered him to be revived again. That just leaves one unresolved thread. The Joker has Talia hostage at the Monarch Theatre, where a young Bruce watched the Mark of Zorro with his parents shortly before they were gunned down in Crime Alley on their way home. When we get there, Talia tries to skewer Joker, only to discover that it's not him, it's Clayface. Talia is then shot by the actual Joker who reveals that Clayface has been tagging in and out with the real deal this entire time. We get a nice flashback of little clues from throughout the story, which are fun to look out for on a second or third playthrough. This flashback isn't exhaustive either. We can find other clues, such as Fugs arguing over sightings of Joker in two places at the same time, or Joker not having any bones in our fight at the steel mill. I also like to think this early reveal that Two-Face had a second gun is also a tongue-in-cheek reference to there being two Jokers, but I may be overanalyzing that. It turns out that the real Joker was never cured, as Talia had intercepted Harley and stolen the cure back. We could even find a tied-up Harley during our previous infiltration of the steel mill, which this reveal retroactively explains. This is the best kind of plot twist, as it seems so obvious in hindsight, 
perfectly fits the lore of the Batman universe and, in a similar vein to the original Scream, makes people theorise and argue as to who we were dealing with in each encounter. What I suppose in this case it should be as simple as, when he looked sickly, it was the real deal, when he looked healthy, it was Clayface. That said, there would be nothing stopping Clayface impersonating the sickly version of Joker. At any rate, we defeat Clayface, drink our dosage of the cure, and then get stabbed in the arm by the Joker, causing us to drop the cure, with the vial smashing on the ground. Having sealed his own fate, Joker dies on the floor and we carry him out in a scene calling back to the painting of Cain and Abel we saw in the game's opening. Assuming we have the Catwoman DLC installed, that is. Otherwise, no symbolism for us. Again, more on that in the DLC section of the video. This plot wound me up. Penguin, despite having one of the best gameplay segments, seemed surplus to requirements. We had three people competing for the role of main antagonist. The underutilised and then killed off Hugo Strange, the leader of the League of Assassins, Ra's al Ghul, and of course, the returning Joker. Ultimately, the clown took the spotlight for a second time, but at least with his death, he can't keep being the primary villain of other Arkham games, right? <laughs> yeah, how forced that might feel. Hugo had so much wasted potential. We said he never made good on his threat to reveal Batman's identity, but even his psychological profiling and studying of Batman never comes into play. He never comes on the intercom to tell his tiger guards, look out, Batman always follows that kick up with a left hook, or watch the gargoyles, he relies on them too much. This feature could have added to the relationship between us, the player, and the in-universe baddie, making the encounters with tiger guards more tense, while also calling on Hugo's intellectual strengths. I don't see how Arkham City got approved or built, even with the mayor in Hugo's pocket and the League of Assassins backing him. Arkham Asylum went to great lengths to make its events plausible. We were explicitly told that Joker had been planning his takeover of the facility for months, using contacts on the inside and outside to make it happen. Arkham City is a step too far for me to suspend my disbelief. Hugo says he wants to be a greater hero than Batman by wiping out criminals. He gets approval for Protocol 10 by claiming Arkham City is a failure and a mass breakout is imminent. We're given updates on the staggering death tolls of Protocol 10, and while that likely includes death row inmates, the majority are probably petty criminals who only had a six month sentence, or one of Hugo's political prisoners who potentially did nothing wrong. Hugo claims his next steps are to open new sites in Keystone and Metropolis to repeat the process. Buddy, who's going to sign off on that given how disastrously your Gotham site has gone? Oracle comes on the radio to express her disbelief that Hugo's gotten away with it. She's clearly disappointed in the city officials, but if anything, having an in-universe character tell me how exceptionally unlikely this situation is doesn't resolve my concerns, it reinforces them, taking me out of the experience even more. Calling attention to this just tells me that the writer's room was aware of the issue, but too lazy to actually make changes and try to fix it. I don't understand Joker's disease. We're told that this acts rapidly. Batman himself tells Robin, Anyone with this blood in them will be dead within 24 hours. Batman himself nearly dies from his infection in Wonder City, even seeing a white light in his deceased parents. He's only able to keep going by drinking a small dose of Lazarus during the Demon Trials, benefiting from its restorative properties. Yet even this isn't enough to cure him. So, do you think you're cured? No, the effects are temporary. The fast-acting nature of this Titanborn illness is further emphasised in radio chatter between Batman, Robin, and Oracle. Bruce, it's not good. Gotham General has at least 30 confirmed cases, there are nearly 50 at Mercy, and it's looking like the pattern repeats all over the city. I've run a simulation. Joker's blood could be in as many as 2,000 people by the morning. The first fatalities are expected soon after that. Meanwhile, although we don't know exactly how long it's been since Arkham Asylum, 
Joker seems to have lasted a lot longer than 24 hours. In fact, when he reveals that he's poisoned hundreds of civilians, he says, I've spent weeks shipping samples of my blood to emergency rooms all over the city. That begs a question. How is Joker able to last weeks while Batman was on death's door after only five hours? We can tell it's been roughly five hours as, shortly before Batman is infected, Hugo Strange announces that Protocol 10 will commence in nine hours. While we're in Wonder City, there's another announcement saying there are four hours to go. Likewise, why are the first public deaths expected by morning? Bruce Wayne has trained himself to the peak of physical fitness, so if he's borderline flatlining after just five hours, a normal person might be dead in only three. The other side of the coin is that while Batman can save himself, he can't save everyone else. The cure required a sample of Raisha's blood to stabilise it. Creating an antidote to the disease that afflicts the clown was easy. Unfortunately, the cure degrades too quickly. It needs a restorative element, some kind of reforming enzyme. Without it, it breaks down before it can help its host. I've seen this before. Finding a suitable enzyme is not the only problem. It needs to be adapted, bonded to human DNA. That will take decades. Time it appears you do not have. What if I told you I know a man who's been exposed to that enzyme for centuries? What man? His name is Raish al Ghul. Bring him to me. All I need is a sample of his blood. It is your only hope. Freeze creates two doses of the cure from that one blood sample. Freeze smashes one and Batman drinks half of the other, with the remainder being spilled on the floor. We also know these were the only samples of the cure that existed. It's over. That was all I could manufacture. Even if the cure hadn't been destroyed and Batman could somehow get the formula to Oracle, how are they supposed to manufacture and distribute the required quantities? Remember, as many as 2,000 people were infected. Even if they could somehow recreate the enzyme without Mr. Freeze, without a sample of the cure, and without more of Raisha's blood, they're still on an impossibly tight deadline. The first casualties are expected by morning, and Batman, an example of a human's maximum potential, was practically dead after just five hours. I can't remember if this is followed up on and explained in Night, I'll make a note to listen out for it when we get to that game, but yeah, this seems like a lost cause within the context of this game that's ultimately swept under the carpet. While I think the characterization and voice acting are fantastic, the core story meanders, tries to involve too many people, and has a larger scope than Rocksteady could handle. I believe they were inspired by No Man's Land, a comic arc where Gotham is cut off from the rest of America and all hell breaks loose. The story takes place across the whole city over the course of 80 issues, pretty much every Batman book put out in 1999 and involves almost every hero and villain in the franchise. Arkham City is a 10 hour game set over the course of a single night in a condemned district of the city. It's considerably more condensed and ends up feeling like a dog chasing cars or a magpie that's constantly getting distracted. We're told, take down Hugo, actually neutralize Joker. Oh no, we need Mr. Freeze. Ah, but the penguins got him. Oh, by the way, Raish is here and you need his blood. Now back to Freeze. Uh oh, Joker sold a cure. Go finish off Hugo. Hey, Raish was behind Hugo's plan the entire time. He's dead now though, save Talia and settle the score with the Joker. It comes across as hyperactive, unfocused and messy. I spent the entire game waiting for the narrative to just pick a lane already. We're not done yet though, Arkham City also had free DLC packs which all of the modern releases include straight out of the box. The first is the controversial Catwoman DLC. Arkham City originally released back in the days where publishers were fighting pre-owned sales by adding one new DLC codes to unlock online multiplayer modes. Yes, really. 
Arkham City didn't have a multiplayer mode, so instead they locked an entire playable character and their story sections behind a single use code in the box. If you dared to buy a used copy of the game, you would have to pay £6.75 to buy Catwoman separately. Yay capitalism! So what does Catwoman add? With her content installed, you start the game with a short combat sequence as Selina. Now the plus side is that this adds some symbolism, with the opening shot of a painting of Cain and Abel mirroring the final shot of Batman carrying Joker's dead body. But on the downside, this mass melee kind of ruins the careful pacing of the main game's tutorial, where you can only counter for the first few minutes. We then cut back to playing as Catwoman every time that Batman takes a nap. Catwoman wants to break into Hugo Strange's vault, but to get in, she's going to need Poison Ivy's help. This lets us explore Arkham City as Catwoman before taking on Ivy. As much as I enjoy Catwoman's unique traversal mechanics that revolve around her whip, I can never time her leaps up buildings, which is a problem as a Riddler challenge requires perfect timing. We need to make a stop by Catwoman's apartment to retrieve her gadgets. Cow traps, which set up traps for unsuspecting goons, and bowlers, which are essentially her batarang stand-in. That's it. That's all of the gadgets we're going to be getting. Selina's a tad underbaked in that regard, which is a shame given what her final boss fight is. After fighting off a few waves of bad guys at Poison Ivy's hideout, we're trapped by the Plant Queen and return to Batman's campaign. When we take control of Catwoman again, we pick up right where we left off, hanging upside down in Ivy's lair, where she's presumably been for hours. Actually, we can count it. Shortly before Catwoman was captured, while playing as Batman, Hugo Strange announces, Protocol 10 will commence in nine hours. There's another announcement before the next Catwoman segment, where the Doctor declares, Good evening. Protocol 10 will commence in 30 minutes. You all have specific orders for this situation. Follow them. This suggests that Catwoman has been hanging upside down in Ivy's lair for eight and a half hours. This is debated among fans, though. We know that raiding Ivy's takes place while Batman is in the steel mill, or at the very least after Joker tries to snipe Selina at the courthouse, because at the start of that segment, Catwoman states, Sounds like the detective will be busy with the Joker for a while. Good. We also know that the section where Ivy releases Catwoman and we break into Stranger's Vault takes place shortly after the 30 minute announcement and Batman's fight with the fake Joker as we see him pinned by debris on the monitor and go to help, directly leading into the next Batman scene where Protocol 10 has started. Side note, we can also unlock a fun secret ending here, with credits and everything, by choosing not to help and instead escaping with the loot. Time rewinds so we can make the right decision afterwards, so I recommend trying it out. The linear nature of the story and the fact we only play as a cat while Bruce is unconscious heavily implies that Catwoman raids Ivy's lair shortly after the 9 hour count, while Batman is blacked out and receiving an involuntary blood transfusion. If we change our perspective and argue that Catwoman's unwelcome arrival at Ivy's could be a flash forward into the future, then it becomes possible that she's not hanging upside down for a full working day at the office. Personally, I think her being upside down for eight and a half hours is just a side effect of the story's pacing. There wasn't another time that Batman was out of commission for us to take control of her in between these two beats, and I accept that it is what it is. I'm sure if we wanted to explore further, we could find evidence from the state of the city and thug dialogue to confirm when everything takes place, but that seems like a lot of effort for something that only overthinkers like me would even notice in the first place. Says a guy who just spent far too long debating this really minor point. We jump back to Catwoman again for a brief epilogue. Two-Face has blown up her apartment and stolen her loot, so she heads to the museum to retrieve it. This is where we get our second stealth-based boss fight of the game. Two-Face is on a bridge in the middle of the room as his men patrol the perimeter. Originally, I thought I would just take out his goons and then target Harvey, but the ex-district attorney will continue to call in infinite waves of support. These villains have some impressive recruitment teams. 
Weirdly, we're better off bullying Two-Face while ignoring everyone else. This and the previous fault section shows how different Catwoman's stealth gameplay is. For one, she can cling on and move along certain ceilings, providing new mobility options. The downside is that this is pretty much all she can do, as her gadget pool is so limited that most of her encounters rely heavily on standard stealth takedowns. In combat, she's much faster and more responsive than Batman, while seemingly dealing less damage. Her animations and combos suit her personality, showing her as a femme fatale. She even gives enemies a kiss before wiping them out. Once again though, her limited gadgets also limits her move pool in a fight, and her health doesn't have as many upgrades as the Bat, making her more fragile. Ultimately, her story inclusions come across as weird pace breakers. While she does have 40 Riddler challenges of her own to complete, a post-game hunt for the rest of her loot, which feels a lot like tracking down Riddler informants, and she's playable in challenge maps, I don't think the people who bought pre-owned copies of the original release missed out on all that much. In some ways, the main story flows better without Catwoman. The second DLC pack, Harley Quinn's Revenge, also added more story content and a new playable character, this time being Robin. Batman returned to Arkham City to apprehend Harley Quinn, but when she defeated him by shooting him with a gun, an act that didn't seem to anger anyone at the time, just saying, Robin goes in to save his mentor. I actually reviewed this DLC in a video I made 11 years ago, which is weird to look back on now. The on-camera sections legitimately give me a sense of depersonalization or derealization, as it feels like I'm looking at someone else, not my past self. A lot of my thoughts regarding this DLC still hold true today. It is a shorter offering that reuses a lot of the main game's steel mill before eventually offering up a new area. In terms of plot, it doesn't offer too much besides telling us Batman has become closed off and insular, following the deaths of Talia and the Joker, while hinting at some friction and distrust between Batman and Robin, which Knight would expand on. It also walks back an easter egg from the base game, in Arkham City, we can find a positive pregnancy test in the steel mill, implying that Harley is pregnant with Joker's child. She even sings Hush Little Baby over the New Game Plus mode's credits. In Harley Quinn's Revenge, however, the same room is littered with negative tests, teasing that the original test may have been a false positive, or that Quinn may have lost the baby. I'm not sure why Roxetti walked this back, perhaps their plans changed, but here it is. The gameplay sees us switching between Batman and Robin at various points. Robin feels quite similar to Bats, he was trained by Bruce after all, but this causes the boy wonder to lack identity. Many of his gadgets are derivatives of Batman's. It's cute that his explosive gel writes an R instead of a bat symbol, but his shurikens and remote shurikens are mechanically identical to Batarangs. He also has a zip kick, which is a variant of the Backlaw that Robin can use to launch himself across gaps and into enemies. Tim's unique gadgets are limited to a bullet shield that does what it says on the tin, doubling up as a way to safely pass jets of steam, and a snap flash which can be attached to enemies to blast them to the ground, or attached to environmental objects to solve… literally one puzzle where we knock down an armed thug in the next room. We do get a boss fight against Harley that mirrors Catwoman's fight with Two-Face. The only difference is that, while Two-Face stuck to one place, Harley roams around. Again, she'll keep calling for backup, so incentivized to ignore her men and just target Quinn. The only real difference being that, where Catwoman's boss fight ended the moment we downed Two-Face, we do have to mop up Harley's thugs after we defeat her. Robin also gets a few large-scale melee brawls which really show off how much of a similar rhythm, weight, and cadence a Boy Wonder has in comparison to his mentor. It makes it very easy to switch between Bruce and Tim as the DLC plays out, but also means that Robin doesn't feel particularly new or special. The only other thing worth noting here is in the DLC's final battle against the Wonder City Guardians. Even on normal difficulty, these don't display notices above their heads to counter their attacks. I'm guessing this is because they're robots? Either way, that makes it an unexpected escalation for normal players, while hard mode players won't notice any difference, as no one has those icons on that difficulty. 
Ultimately, Robin is cool and novel, but we don't spend enough time with him. Most of his gadgets are only used once during a natural playthrough. To get a feel for him, we have to jump into challenge mode and complete the combat and predator rooms with him. Regrettably, challenge maps are all that our third and final playable character, Nightwing, ever got. Dick is my favourite member of the Bat family, but I often forget that he's even in this game because he never featured in any story content. He's fun to play as, his agility and strength placing him in between Batman and Catwoman, but again, his stealth gadgets are limited and largely copies of the Bats. I wish I had more to say about him and more reason to play as him, but his DLC really didn't offer us very much. Thankfully, Nightwing plays a bigger role in Night, so hold on to that thought for now. One thing that Arkham City did add to the formula, which all of the DLC characters also benefit from, is alternate costumes. This would become a series staple, with fans regularly debating which Arkham games have the best bat suits. For me, while I adore every character's animated series outfits, I think they translated amazingly well into 3D, and I think both the Year One and Earth One suits are brilliant fits tonally, I often find myself using the Batman R.I.P. era costumes from shortly before the New 52 started. So the Batman Inc. Batsuit and Red Robin. Normally, you have to complete the main story before you can switch costumes in the main game, but Return to Arkham City, the PS4 and Xbox One remaster, let me choose when loading a regular save before I had finished a normal run. At any rate, I'm very happy that City started this tradition, and we got some amazing outfits in later games as a direct result. Okay, so we're agreed that the game is brilliant, even if I still prefer Asylum. Now we need to ask ourselves which version of the game we're going to fire up. We'll start with the lowest fidelity version, the PlayStation 3. It's no surprise to hear that this is a bare-bones 720p 30fps version of the game with a noticeable lack of anti-aliasing that looks and feels dated today. That said, we have to appreciate that it was respectable in its own time, earning high review scores that praised its largely stable frame pacing, decent load times, and a pleasing presentation. It was disappointing to see that some cutscenes appeared to be pre-rendered with noticeable compression artifacts. While I can understand having to compress these sequences to fit on an Xbox 360's dual-layer DVDs, the PlayStation 3's use of Blu-rays provided the space to hold higher quality versions. In fact, we even saw that in games like Final Fantasy XIII, where the PS3 outing has noticeably higher quality cutscenes. Sadly, I can only assume that the Xbox may have been the lead platform for Arkham City, and the PS3 ended up with the same compressed video files. Speaking of the Xbox 360 release, while I don't have that version to hand, Eurogamer's face-off, think Digital Foundry before Digital Foundry was a thing, concluded that the two versions were pretty much identical. Arkham City isn't backwards compatible on Xbox One or Series X, likely because the Return to Arkham remasters, which we'll talk about in a moment, are available instead. That means we don't have any Series X enhancements to consider either. These versions of the games can be found for less than the price of a Snickers Duo, so if you want to play Arkham City and you still have a PS3 or 360 hooked up, it's a cheap and cheerful way to get the job done. There's even a Game of the Year printing that includes all of the DLC on disc. Moving over to the PC, which is the main version I played for this review, and wow! This is a console version unshackled, supporting higher resolutions, frame rates, and improved texture resolution. We get to enjoy dynamic shadows, better reflections, and higher levels of anti-aliasing. Visually, this makes a strong case for just how well games from that generation can still hold up today, despite being over a decade old. I did experience some noticeable stutters and frame drops when flying over the titular city. This was most apparent during Zaz's side quests, where I was racing from one payphone to the next. My gut instinct said it might be a data streaming issue, as I was likely passing through multiple invisible loading zones at speed, so I moved the game files from my mechanical hard drive to my solid state drive, and the issue immediately disappeared. 
Based on that experience, I would recommend installing the game to an SSD. I did encounter three glitches during my playthrough. The first was this item hanging in mid-air as I saved this doctor. It looks like a hot poker that a guard may have been threatening her with. For whatever reason, this prop got separated from its character and hung here in mid-air. The second was an extra shot of Catwoman during a cutscene. Her lips were moving, but no sound came out, and there were no accompanying subtitles. I'm not sure why the game cut back to an earlier camera angle and seemingly replayed this slip animation. The other was more severe. During the final battle of the Harley Quinn's Revenge DLC, the game completely froze, threw me an error message, and closed out. I managed to grab a screenshot of the error message. It read rendering thread exception fatal error with a series of addresses where file names couldn't be found. It seems like the game called for some graphics files and couldn't retrieve them for some reason. I was able to reload my save and complete the fight normally on a second attempt, but it was certainly a memorable way to wrap up my time with the DLC. Here's a bonus one added during editing. While collecting Catwoman's Riddler trophies, I went to hang from the bottom of a walkway and somehow ended up out of bounds. I don't know how to capture footage from a Steam Deck yet, I should really look into that, but I did manage to snap this quick photo of it. This is another very cheap option. The Game of the Year edition, which includes all of the DLC, has a regular price of £14.99GBP on Steam, but it regularly falls to £3.74 in Steam sales. If you have a Steam Deck, I can also confirm it runs beautifully there. I've been using mine to chip away at Riddler trophies and challenge maps, which are a perfect fit for when you just have 30 minutes on the go. Here's a surprising release. Arkham City Armored Edition is the Wii U version of the game, as ported by Warner Bros. Montreal, the developers of Arkham Origins. This fills in an interesting bit of history for me. Arkham City released in October 2011. This Armored Edition port followed in late 2012, and Origins then hit shelves in time for the holidays in 2013. It seems like WB Montreal may have cut their teeth and gotten used to Roxetti's tools with this port before making their own entry into the franchise. This is a very interesting and unique version of Arkham City. Everything is built around the armored suits Batman and Catwoman are wearing, hence the Armored Edition name. This isn't the same armor you can use in Arkham Asylum's challenge modes. It has a new design which incorporates a touchscreen into Batman's gauntlet. This is the in-universe version of the Wii U gamepad, which is used to decode radio frequencies, view the map, and use new abilities, such as a sonar function. It's novel, but a little clunky as is often the case with Wii U gamepad gimmicks. It also introduces BAT mode, where your gloves power up and your strikes become more powerful. If that sounds familiar, it's because Warner Bros. Montreal brought this feature back as the shock gloves in Arkham Origins. It was kind of cool to see them playing with the idea here. These changes and additions result in some new tutorial dialogue, as well as additional and altered cinematics. It's weird seeing these costumes, having gotten so used to the vanilla versions. It gave me the same feeling as going to see the Power Rangers movie when I was a kid. I was so used to seeing these spandex costumes on my TV screen, and then we got the spectacle of these more tactical and militia-inspired outfits on the big screen. Catwoman's suit even has an in-universe explanation as being a prototype for a female version of Batman's suit. That has some worrying implications. Who was Bruce making that female suit for? Barbara is already Oracle, and he seems to be frenemies with Selina rather than having her as an active member of the Bat family. Does this also mean that Catwoman not only knows where the Batcave is, but successfully infiltrated it undetected to steal the suit? There might be an in-game explanation later on for all I know. I didn't stick around long enough to find out. As you can likely see from the footage, this version of the game runs horribly. It feels even worse than it looks in the hand. Arkham Combat is rhythmic, timing is crucial, and this was just frustrating to play due to frequent slowdowns. The shockingly bad performance is a deal breaker, regardless of how curious you are about the changes made. I also have to question the presentation. 
Side by side with other versions of the game, you can see that either the brightness is too high, the contrast is too low, possibly both, as blacks become greys. Admittedly, I couldn't put my finger on the issue until I compared my footage with other versions, but something felt distractingly off about the way the game looked throughout. We also have the most heavily compressed cutscenes yet, with big blotchy patches ruining every pre-rendered scene. This doesn't make any sense. The Xbox 360 uses 8.5GB dual-layer DVDs, while the Wii U uses proprietary Wii U optical discs that hold up to 25 gigabytes of data. So why are the Wii U cutscenes more heavily compressed than the 360s? Whichever way you look at it, Arkham City Armored Edition is an absolute mess that should be avoided at all costs. You might remember that I wasn't a big fan of Arkham Asylum's Return to Arkham Remaster. I was conflicted with its lackluster performance and its conscious changes to the game's aesthetic and visual mood. Given that, you may be expecting me to hate Arkham City's PlayStation 4 and Xbox One remaster. Despite persistent rumours that Arkham City runs at up to 60fps on PS4 Pro and PS5, I got a consistent 30fps while capturing this footage on my PlayStation 5. Doing further reading, it seems you have to be running version 1.0 without any patches or updates to get this version up to 60, but I don't expect the average consumer to do that, and I figure it probably also means missing out on bug fixes. It's a shame, I've certainly been spoiled by the PC 60fps, and it's hard to go back as combat does feel a tad more sluggish. But it gets the job done, especially if you prefer to play on consoles. As before, the presentation has been updated with new textures, lighting, and special effects. Thankfully, Batman still looks like himself rather than the botched Botox mannequin we got in Return to Arkham Asylum, and the overall graphical style is still in keeping with the original's tone. Arkham City's wet streets and neon signs look amazing with this new treatment. I still prefer the original, which had more pronounced uses of inky blacks, with lights seeming somewhat hazy and a dark blue hue that evoked the cold winter setting. My PlayStation 5 console, TV, and capture card all automatically switch to 1080p for standard HD content. One plus is that my TV reports an Ultra HD 4K signal when running Return to Arkham City on PS5, with my Elgato 4K 60S Plus also detecting and recording a 4K input signal. I'm not sure if it's a true native 4K or a low resolution such as 1440p upscaled to 4K, but the end result looks fantastic to my eyes. The PC version can go to 4K, but the subtitles get smaller and harder to read. It's also hard for me to appreciate 4K resolutions on my 24-inch PC monitor due to the pixel density of the screen. It's a much more noticeable and appreciated upgrade on the 50-inch TV my consoles are hooked into. Return to Arkham is also content complete, giving us all of the DLC. It can be an economic way to play these games as well. Its recommended retail price is $39.99 GBP, however it can often be bought alongside Arkham Knight as part of the Batman Arkham Collection for as little as £7.49. That's a steal for free fantastic games. Overall, this is a solid option, especially for console players. While this isn't my preferred way to play, I can easily see why others would choose this release over any of the others. When we covered Arkham Asylum, the Switch Arkham Trilogy hadn't been released yet, and I couldn't cover it. Now that the Switch version is out, I simply refuse to cover it. Many outlets have reported on the trilogy's unacceptable performance levels, and I cannot, in good conscience, give Warner Bros. £40 for a subpar effort. Hopefully, the poor reception leads to patches and improvements, making this section age like milk. Right here and now, though, if you want to play Arkham on the go, grab a Steam Deck. It's really that simple. There are only two bad versions of Arkham City, and regrettably, they're both on Nintendo platforms. Otherwise, you can't go wrong with the native release on your platform of choice. I reach for my PC or Steam Deck first, but I'm also perfectly happy sinking into the couch in front of Return to Arkham on my PS5. This has been one of my longer videos. 
Arkham City is so packed with content and little details that, even at whatever insane length this video has reached, there'll still be things I'll realise I forgot to mention and kick myself for later on. Now you might be thinking, Sam, I expected you to be harsher to Arkham City. To an extent, so did I. I knew this would probably be a positive review, but I thought the overly ambitious scope and constantly competing plot priorities would be far more damaging than they were. I had a lot more fun revisiting Arkham City than I had expected to, and I have a new level of appreciation for it. My favourite entry in the series is still Asylum. Its core gameplay was far more focused, the Asylum itself was the star of the show, and the limited traversal options meant we encountered a higher quantity of bespoke and engaging handcrafted encounters. That said, I can now see why people would say Arkham City is their favourite, and I might hesitate before considering it to be a basic bitch answer. The Arkham series is absolutely worth experiencing. The trilogy containing Arkham's Asylum, City, and Night, because the publishers seem to have a grudge against and regularly exclude Origins for some reason, regularly goes on sale for as little as £6.49 GBP for all three games. That's an absolute steal for some of the best games I've ever played. Now, while Warner Brothers might shun Arkham Origins and pretend that it doesn't exist, I very much do want to shine a spotlight on it. In fact, I started this particular retrospective because the Switch trilogy was the second re-release to not include Origins. Our next stop on this tour of Virtual Gotham goes back in time to a younger, angrier Bruce as I defend the black sheep of this franchise. If you want to be the first to know when that video goes live, subscribe to the channel and ring the notifications bell. A huge shout out to my Patreon supporters, who are Chuckleson, Crow, Tiny Jericho, Mr. Terry Chaos, Ducky Go, Francis T218, and The Villarator. If you want to see scripts and bonus content, go and sign up to the Patreon in the link in the description. You can also support the channel for free by liking, commenting, and sharing this video with a friend. In the meantime, I have over a decade's worth of content on this channel for you to browse and enjoy. Why not start with my review of Arkham Asylum if you've not seen it already?